Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on our very first Unlimited Voices webinar. Uh, we're super excited to be here. This is our very first uh, Unlimited Voices webinar. And so bear with us as we try to learn this platform and how it uh, operates. But we have some wonderful guests. Uh, my name is Del Jolly. I am a co-founder of Unlimited Sciences, which is a psychedelic research nonprofit, uh, combining the power of data and lived experiences to help uh, educate the public, uh, inform the community, and also inform uh, common sense practices and policies. Uh, we are teaming with Johns Hopkins University to launch a study very soon. We uh, have been working on this for quite some time, but have uh, delayed um, the launch due to COVID, which is kind of what brings us here to this webinar series. And uh, as I mentioned, we're a nonprofit. We are funding, we've funded our first year of collaboration with Johns Hopkins. And uh, if you guys are so called to um, support Unlimited Sciences, please do. You can find out more at unlimitedsciences.org. Um, our uh, studies that we are launching can help uh, inform people of best practices, potentially help uh, inform clinical study, uh, all, all sorts of uh, the different types of information that we need to know as the world starts to uh, re-engage with uh, psychedelics. So, uh, just a heads up in the right hand corner of the webinar uh, platform, you could ask questions. So if you have any um, questions, please type it there at the end, we will, we will get to those. And as um, we continue with the conversation, we'll, uh, our moderator will send me some of those questions so I could um, ask them to you all. Uh, Let's see, I wanted to state that, you know, we're very thrilled to have our uh, guests here today who've taken a chance to give us this opportunity to dive into what they're doing and how they are serving their communities. When we first started thinking about this Unlimited Voices webinar, we were trying to think of a relevant subject with COVID and obviously community is very, very important. And so each one of our guests has been selected because they have uh, built communities uh, in some of them very, very quickly, um, all focused on the powers of psychedelics. Um, and beyond that, uh, social media platforms. And so I want to introduce my guests today. Our first guest, I'm going to read this just because it's a, it's a little bit easier for me, but Dr. Ali Fiducia is a PhD, is a neuropharmacologist, psychedelic researcher, and a builder of virtual and in-person communities. She's the co-founder and director of Psychedelic Support and Project New Day. In these roles, Ali facilitates the spreading of evidence-based knowledge, connection to resources, and strategies for communities to maximize the potential therapeutic benefits of psychedelics through safe and responsible practices. Thank you so much for joining us, Allie. Jonathan Glazer is an entrepreneur and an ac with an academic background in psychology and neuroscience and an innate interest in how entheogens impact the mind and body. Jonathan is also the founder of Thank You Plant Medicine. Along with his team, Jonathan built a global community of over 20,000 followers and support from over 90 global organizations all within a year. Thank you, Jonathan, for joining us. And our final is um, Mike Slavin is the executive director of High Existence. is a media publication and global community devoted to helping people transcend the ordinary and live with more wisdom and wonder. So today we'll be discussing the ways uh, to that we could continue to build community and integrate lessons from psychedelics in light of the challenges posed by our current uh, current situation. So, and I also wanna just state one uh, quick thing that's been really, really important to me. It, we were speaking about community and uh, 
this week on Tuesday, um, our community, the, uh, our sister organization, the Realm of Caring, lost um, Charlotte Figgy, who's a little girl who had seizures and kind of revolutionized medical marijuana. Uh, her story was on CNN, and uh, she passed away on uh, Tuesday due to uh, epilepsy. And um, it's really hit our community um, hard. It's made me think a lot about how important it is to build uh, people around you who love you and can support you throughout these tough times. And uh, she is undoubtedly uh, an inspiration. Our co-founder, Heather Jackson, started the Realm of Caring with um, Charlotte's mom, Paige. And so I just want to make an acknowledgement of uh, Charlotte and that beautiful soul who's made such an enormous impact in so such a short amount of time. And so Unlimited Sciences and the Realm of Caring will continue to do our work to advance her message and uh, through the communities that we've built. So wanted to say a quick um, thank you to Charlotte and um, Paige. So uh, with that, I'd like to talk with our guest and uh, Allie, if we could start with you and maybe you could uh, start with uh, where are you and uh, tell us a little bit about the, the projects that you're focused on. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm calling in from Santa Cruz, California. And um, I've been working in the field of psychedelics for a while, doing primarily research with MDMA. And from this work, I really started to see the need for a greater connection to professional resources. And so a couple of years ago, uh, my husband and I launched a website called psychedelic.support. And here we've grown uh, this network of licensed mental health providers to be about 200 people now. And individuals can come to the site and search for either providers online or people that may be in their community. And in doing this, you know, we really saw that there was a lot of stigma around psychedelic use, especially a couple years ago. And for professionals to feel secure to come out and offer services around integration or harm reduction, or just uh, any other type of mental health care where people may want to have a professional that has some knowledge or experience around uh, people that use psychedelics. And so this uh, community of professionals has really grown as has the users that come to the site. And so we're really about also advancing information and evidence-based practices so we pl uh, publish blogs and help share information through social media. And then um, about a year ago, I was connected with Mike Sinyard, who's the founder of Specialized Bicycles. And he was really inspired by the work that is going on with psychedelics, especially for the research related to treatments for addiction. And he has a really uh, been personally connected with some people that have struggled with addiction and sees the limitations of the currently available treatments. And so we started talking and um, decided to start a new foundation called Project New Day. And this foundation is really aimed to advance research and treatments of psychedelics for people that have addiction, addiction disorders. And our first project that we're really focusing on is, um, it's called the Psychedelics in Recovery Outreach and Service. So we've convened a committee of clinicians and community peer providers who are hosting groups for people that have substance use disorders that are using psychedelics to help in their recovery. And so there's a few of these groups that are operating in San Francisco and New York. And we're doing a needs assessment to try to understand if we could build a model around this and help other people start these groups. And we really see that the long-term um, benefits of having a community, it, you know, psychedelics can, I think, help jumpstart a process or help people find clarity around their situation. But we know that especially addictions, it's a you know, chronic relapsing disorder for a lot of people in that most of the time, it's not just the psychedelic experience that helps them to overcome um, an addiction. So it's this long-term care and 
coming together with community and people that maybe understand um, the experiences of psychedelics and can provide more integration type uh, services is a way that could potentially really help people overcome and stay um, with their goals of using substances less problematically. Yeah, that's something that I think doesn't get highlighted enough when they talk about smoking cessation in these psilocybin studies is the idea that uh, there's intensive cognitive behavioral therapy that goes on before and after. And um, it's not just the psychedelics, it's some of that professional uh, level that uh, psychedelic support seems to be offering to the community. Yeah, it's a real journey, people go on when they are ready to change their behavior around substance use and the community and individuals around them could be very important you know people can help in their recovery give support it can help with isolation depression that often accompanies these types of um, conditions and we are interested in uh, working with the teams at NYU and John Hopkins University that are conducting the psilocybin trials for nicotine and alcohol use disorders. And uh, informally, there was already seven participants out of the alcohol use study that uh, joined a peer support group. And so they're looking to expand that work. And we're really interested in measuring the outcomes of people that are coming out of these clinical trials and joining groups, as well as people that will be joining groups that are seeking psychedelics on their own, whether they're going to Ibogaine clinics in Mexico or Canada or local groups or, ex you know, having these experiences on their own. We really want to have some data and information around how these groups can support people. Very good. Thank you so much, Allie. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, how are you? Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, Tell us a little bit about the outcome of the Thank You Plant Medicine campaign. What, what has come from that? And uh, maybe just a real quick uh, intro as far as how you got that started and how it uh, progressed so quickly. Thank you, Dale. First of all, thank you for having me be here and uh, to have the opportunity to speak on uh, the first webinar of Unlimited Sciences. Uh, the movement started back in the in June last year, 19, uh, in the World Ayahuasca Conference that was organized by ICERS. There was an idea uh, what, what would happen if we connect the global community, uh, people that have benefited from psychedelics and endogenic plants. Everybody shared their stories on that day using a certain hashtag and uh, kind of creating a global symphony of gratitude to the experiences we many of us had. And that idea uh, kind of had a life of its own uh, when we put it out into the social media and the movement grew pretty quickly. And we found out that a lot of people want to join. And I think one, one of the uh, success factors to the Thank You Plant Medicine movement, what became the Thank You Plant Medicine, a common denominator that we all share. We share healing story. Uh, Mike has one, Ali has one, I have one, and we can all uh, connect on that level. It's a common denominator. And what happened is, is that uh, as we grew, we grew our volunteer base. It, it went up to 900 people from 68 countries. Uh, we started also uh, looking for the organizations to support us, big organizations that have led the way for many years, uh, MAPS, the Beckley, ISIS, Chakruna, uh, and many, many others, Psychedelic Society of the Globe. And we found out that people are willing to share and, 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 and connect and commute, uh, commune with each other, communicate with each other, and plan together. And the outcome was uh, a beautiful celebration for plant medicine, entogenic plants, and synthetic psychedelics as well. Uh, that was uh, focused on healing, uh, focused on gratitude for healing for individuals. We had 29 events, physical events, in locations such as uh, Los Angeles, London, New York, Berlin, Copenhagen, Lisbon, Tel Aviv, Mumbai, and many other locations. Those events online, uh, and one of the common 
uh, testimony that people say, you know, they, when you come out with your friends and family and tell them, hey, this really helped me. This is the first step of coming to terms with one own experience, but it's also a first step to within my close circle of friends and family. And uh, there was a lot of catharsis. There's a lot of sensation of liberation, of coming to terms and, and, and creating a more mature conversation around what many of us believe uh, should and can be a therapy modality, but also a growth modality that can get into society. So that was the outcome. The outcome was a flood of gratitude on social media and, and really your organizations and, and many others supported this. Uh, today we are uh, around 12,000 members on the different social platforms and we are looking to get the, to continue roll the ball forward and move as a global collective, as a global collective that has common grounds to help local initiatives. So there are many local initiatives and we as a global community can help those initiatives by voting, by donations, by action. And that's what we are looking to uh, continue to create through the Thank You Plant Medicine movement. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, uh, I really enjoyed your partner, David, when he was uh, conveying that this is a, I think why it resonated with so many people is because it was a message of gratitude first and foremost. And it's just a, yeah. just thank you. Not, you know, not political, not anything like that. It's just a gratitude campaign. So I thought it was very well done. Um, very impressed with how quickly you guys organized and all the wonderful uh, groups that you got to um, contribute and, and uh, cast that message as well. So um, good job to you guys. Thank you so much. Mike, tell us a little bit about High Existence and uh, your very large platform that you guys operate from and uh, what you guys are up to and how people could get involved with what, you, what you're doing. Very excited to be here. So High Existence has been a, a media publication that's been around for over 10 years. And in that time, we've been publishing uh, on a variety of topics that often run uh, counter to main. It's hard to fully remember, but if you can, uh, the place that meditation or mindfulness or psychedelics had even 10 years ago was at a very different space in the culture. And so we've been in some ways providing safe haven for people to come discuss and learn about some of these things that um, had a lot of stigma associated with them. And of course, there is still, still stigma today, but I think we're breaking through a lot of that stigma quite dramatically with all of the amazing research that has been coming out. Um, and so as far as how people can get involved, uh, you can check out our website, highexistence.com. There's, there's a treasure trove of resources that people can, can dive into. Um, given that we've been around for so long, we've published a lot of evergreen content on, on a lot of these things. You know, going outside of, we're not exclusively focused on psychedelics, but we offer tools and resources for people to, to help navigate, particularly in times of uncertainty. So we've covered a lot of things related to stoicism, meditation, mindfulness, and, uh, and many other things. And so I think one of the things that I'm hearing uh, from Ali and Jonathan is uh, the power of, of community and, and the power of gratitude. And I've been as I've been in conversations with people and, and sort of getting a, a sense or a, a gauge for what people are really struggling with, one of the things that is arising is the, the tension between staying informed and understanding what's going on with being able to, to, to go, go about your life and actually you know, remain grounded and, and centered amidst it all. And I think there's a real difficulty um, that we're being faced with, with all of the information that we're being sort of bombarded by. And so that pursuit of certainty right now is uh, probably ill-advised to some degree, staying and, and watching a ton of media and news, uh, although it might be driven from, from the interest of wanting to keep yourself informed, might actually be instilling more fear. Um, and so I just encourage people to pursue perhaps a path of clarity and, and that would be a bit more uh, focused on independent of our inability to make sense of what's going on and recognizing that we're all thrown into a radical departure from normalcy and we're experiencing great uncertainty and accepting that. Find what it is that you can do today that's very 
near you, that's that's local to you, that independent of of the uncertainty still makes sense to do. And hearing what Ali and, and Jonathan are saying, it 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 brings me into the place of tending to the social fabric around us. You know, one of the things psychedelics can offer people is a sense of interconnectedness, a sense of communion, and to really give rise to that within ourselves right now. And uh, uh, encourage ourselves to reach out to people, to check in on one another, to, um, as some people are saying, you know, let this be physical distancing, but not social isolation, remaining in contact with those we love and care about. So I, I just wanted to bring that uh, to uh, into this into this conversation. And there's more that, that High Existence is doing explicitly to help people. We're, uh, towards the end of April, we're going to have a three-day stay-at-home retreat that is designed to help people cultivate emotional resilience, to generate meaning, to fortify their communities during this time. And uh, if you want to learn more about that, we're going to be announcing it shortly on our newsletter. Um, but that, I think we're, we're entering a phase where we're going to see a lot of unique and novel approaches to doing community online. It's going to go beyond the bounds of simply hopping on a, a group video chat um, or doing a webinar or things like that. And having this kind of community participation that that you're doing here, Dell, I think is is moving in that direction. So that's where I'll start. Yeah, thank you for that, Mike. That's good insight and uh, a lot of action being taken, which I really enjoy. It's uh, always, everybody always has an opinion about something, but to take action and do something is really important as well. And so, Ali, on that front, you know, with the social distancing, how is, you know, psychedelic support or Project New Day um, approaching this, this distancing aspect to it. I, one thing that's interesting about psychedelics, as we know, is it is it's a very, very communal uh, to have circle, to be with people, to express physically with uh, people is really important. How do we operate in this new, you know, this webinar world? This is uh, not as personal. What are the long-term effects? And uh, from like the professional level, what are your thoughts about how this is affecting community? Well, of course, it's always nice to be able to gather with others and to look into someone's eyes in person. But with the technology that we have today, it is quite remarkable how we can come together online and people can continue to have therapeutic care with a professional or with other peers. So I know a lot of the peer recovery groups and other integration groups for uh, anyone who wants to attend have moved to online formats. And I think people are probably fine tuning how to run these groups in this new fashion as a way of um, allowing everyone to be seen and heard can be more of a challenge when you're on a meeting such as this. So I think people are modifying their approaches, but in some ways it, it may even give people more accessibility. Sometimes it's difficult to get to that in-person meeting that's across town on a Friday. So it may be that more people are joining groups. I did hear that the Re Psychedelics and Recovery group had uh, 35 people attend last week, and I think their normal attendance is around 12. So that's a quite an increase in um, that that group, for example. And uh, yeah, I did just encourage people, you know, to to do what they can to maintain these uh, connections with people, and it's. Uh, quite the time we live in where, you know, your community isn't defined by your geographical like, location. Communities are really places you can opt into around the world and lots of support out there for whatever people may be experiencing right now. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, an interesting fact about some of the people who have registered to be part of this uh, webinar series. We have people from Japan, Russia, mm -hmm. Argentina, Thailand, so there is um, a lot of interest on the subject and uh, with, with our new ability to reach the entire world, it brings us together, which uh, um, again is very much something that Jonathan, that you uh, had seen and accomplished with Thank You Plant Medicine. Uh, how about your community, Jonathan? What else is um, happening uh, for Thank You Plant Medicine and, and what is kind of the future? What are, what are some of the things that you guys are doing to take action uh, during this pandemic? 
Right. So one of the things we saw is how much people like to come together in physical space. And so after the coming out day, we said, okay, let's, let's create more opportunities for people to come together. And then the pandemic advanced and the, it created a, pretty much a global lockdown. Uh, so we, we changed our, uh, and we said, okay, we cannot meet in, phys in physical spaces. Let's create online uh, integration circles as a service for the community. And we are test, test driving this for the last uh, week uh, with three times a week where we uh, open a space, we have moderators, volunteers, and we have people connecting from all over the world to participate in sharing stories, in integrating lessons, and thinking how they can take those experiences into their day-to-day uh, -day life. So this is one thing we did as a community service. And just a week ago, uh, the, the, our friends from SCORE, uh, Kevin Matthews, uh, Matthew Duffy, and uh, uh, Dr. Bronner, David Bronner's, uh, they came up with a great idea to create an online festival uh, happening on Bicycle Day, Bicycle Day, which is uh, April 19th. So as a community, we look to support these initiatives that build up uh, trust, build up communication, build up activity, and uh, more interrelated interrelation between the people that are involved in the Thank You Plant Medicine, but also between the organizations. Another action we took is support ICERS. They had a fundraising campaign last month, and we supported them within our community to help them reach their goal of the fundraising. They are doing fundraising for the Ayahuasca Defense Fund or a defense fund that basically helps people that get in trouble because of uh, working with antigenic plants. Uh, so we helped them. Another thing we did, we collaborated with Fantastic Fungi into their launch of uh, the Fantastic Fungi Day, which was uh, March 26th. So we're looking for opportunities to collaborate and create more community and really help move the ball forward and be of service to the, to the greater community. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I've got a question online here that I'm going to ask, and it says, any suggestions on groups, organizations to connect with in the Los Angeles uh, area? And uh, Ali, you'd mentioned the AWARE project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> this is a great organization. They've, they've been uh, operating for some years now and they do lots of events to bring people together. They bring in different speakers. They also host integration circles. They have a listing of community providers there. So I definitely recommend checking out the AWARE project and uh, Ashley Booth, uh, one of the founders, is also working on the MDMA assisted psychotherapy trials in Los Angeles. There's a study site there. I imagine there's probably others, but I'm familiar with that one that I'd recommend. And Mike, where is the, do you know where the base of your community is as far as do you have uh, mostly folks from the United States? The interaction that you're seeing um, on your platform, is that mostly from the United States? Are there other countries who seem to be uh, interested in what you're doing as far as the psychedelic thing? Yeah, the the bulk of our audience is definitely coming out of the United States, but we, we do have a lot of traffic uh, from the United Kingdom and from Canada. Um, and of course, it's it spans globally, but we see significant chunks coming from um, from from the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom. Very good. What are, uh, I've got a question here for uh, any uh, specific resources to uh, Mexico. Um, Puerto Vallarta is uh, specifically to that. Is there any groups or organizations that you guys know of that are in that area? Or maybe a better question is, I know Ali, your website provides uh, professional services and I think you could type in your zip code and it will find uh, the nearest professional in the space. What are some resources for people to find out to quote unquote, find the others? Uh, 
Uh, yes, there, you can search our site by location. There's also a few another site called Psychedelic Communities or Psychedelic Dot Community, I believe it's called, where you can find other psychedelic societies or organizations or people in your area. That could be another place to check out. The Chakruna Institute also provides a lot of information and events online. I know they've done a conference in Mexico before. So there's a lot of uh, good research, cultural discussions uh, on this uh, platform, chakruna.net. Yeah, they're, they're a wonderful organization. They, uh, they started their uh, them, uh, maps and I saw Bia Labate on the uh, maps uh, webinar yesterday. So she's always a powerhouse in this community and a uh, really good resource there as well. Yeah, John, they have an online conference coming up in just a few weekends, uh, Cognitive Liberty Summit. So if people are interested, they can now tune in online. That's right. Yeah, I saw that they moved that. And I think there's also, uh, we had posted something, I can't remember what it was called, but any webinars that are being hosted by organizations like this, you could go, uh, I'll have our moderator uh, send this out, but it's a community of, you put it on the calendar if there's a webinar that you guys are hosting and uh, people could attend on that. I can't remember, Mike um, Margolius is running that, I believe is his name. Um, yeah, psychedelic seminars. Yeah, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Here's a question. Uh, in Chicago, are there any psychedelic assisted therapies available? Uh, this person is new to this and uh, would like to know if there's anything like that. When it comes to, you know, MAPS MDMA trials or psilocybin trials, they seem so um, difficult to get in. Allie, can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, so there's a website. MDMA, um, mdmaptsd.org. So they've now moved their screening process to be online. And so people first complete a survey to see if they will potentially qualify. And then the study sites reach out to individuals to do a phone screen. And there is definitely a lot of people on the waiting list and a lot of people interested in joining these trials. And I know, um, Right now, they've had to put the in-person sessions on pause due to the virus, but are still supporting people through online therapy that had already been entered, had already entered the study. There was also just expanded access program that was approved by the FDA. So MAPS is going to be able to open 10 more sites and there will be 50 additional patients that will be enrolled at these sites. And, and this is outside of the phase three trials. Very good. Uh, we have a question from my dear friend, Lynn Marie of uh, the Plant Medicine Podcast. Wonderful human being. Thank you for joining Lynn Marie. Uh, any thoughts on things to consider when deciding whether to undertake a psychedelic journey during quarantine? I'd like everybody's opinion on this because uh, I've seen a big uptick in people wanting to use psychedelics because they have the time um, but a lot of them are doing it on their own and I know I know of several people who are wanting to do this for the first time in a while what are your guys' thoughts around that as far as if you could potentially need help but are socially um, distancing uh, how do you feel about that Allie? Yes it's it's a, you know, it's a difficult time. I think of people that, it, you know, it's hard to think of everyone at home and maybe lacking resources to, to reach out. But I think that there are people stepping up in the community to offer a lot of free, free things, a lot of peer support. There's an upcoming bicycle day celebration on April 19th that is gonna be moved to a virtual platform. And I know Zendo Project is going to be offering a virtual uh, harm reduction space. So this isn't a part of MAPS. Usually they go out to festivals and set up a safe space for anyone who may be having a difficult time. And so they're looking to offer this resource now online on Bicycle Day. 
Yeah, we saw that, Jonathan. I think that you are part of that uh, bicycle day. Uh, what are your thoughts on potentially using psychedelics while socially distancing? Yeah, I, I think it really depends on the person and, and how much experience uh, she or he have. Uh, and I, I'd I'd say if you're very experienced, of course, it's uh, it's a different story. You know you know what you're getting into. and you feel uh, conscientious about it or, or a bit worried about it, as, as Dale and Ali said, there is tons of resources online, groups you can join, and even people offering uh, online trip sitting uh, engagements. Uh, so you can, you can look for a good trip sitter that will uh, be connected with you online while you go through your experience. So I'd say really listen to uh, what you feel, uh, don't take unnecessary risk, and uh, and enjoy it. Mike, what about you? What do you think about uh, uh, using psychedelics during quarantine time? Any thoughts or techniques, tips, ideas, cautions? Yeah, I, I would. Um, yeah, I think it's a it's sort of to be determined on a on an individual basis. If you're someone who is, you know, kind of trapped very small New York City apartment with sirens going by every 15 minutes, that environment might not be the best. If you're somewhere where you do have access to more open space and the local um, sort of the, the local laws at, at that stage allow you to, to go out and get some fresh air, because I know there are some, some countries where that's not even an option right now, I think that would be uh, useful to consider just what is what is the set and setting you're getting into um, have someone you can call and talk to you know plan for that in advance wherever that comes from if it's coming from one of these uh, these online services or a friend that you have um, and if they can be present there with you even better um, and I'd also suggest just checking with yourself is it is your desire to do it coming from a place of wanting to escape what's happening um, because I think you will, it's, it's possible you will discover that, that it won't really take you there. It won't, it won't let you kind of escape the situation or, or the environment. It's going to cause you to confront some of the things that you might not have been willing to face. Um, and so I would just be mindful of those things. I think that's a really good point, Mike. I think, uh, people tend to sometimes approach these things like there'll be an escape yet. They can really amplify it. And the truth is, during this time, this is a very, very interesting time to be human and to experience this and to be fully present. I think that that's kind of important to um, be here now and to um, experience this difficult time. We, we, we spend a lot of time trying to avoid any sort of discomfort. Uh, this is uh, discomfort in your face all day, every day for the unforeseeable future. So sometimes it's, uh, could be used as a good, uh, tool to maybe start diving into this meditation practice or some breathing or some exercise or some of these other opportunities that this time is presenting us the opportunity to slow down. So I'd suggest to try to, uh, try to be with this moment. So, uh, a question that I think that we want to start asking folks, um, as we uh, continue with this series is what was your first experience with psilos or uh, psychedelics as a whole um, and, and kind of what what brought you to psychedelics what made this uh, important enough for you to get involved this deeply and uh, Jonathan if we could start with you tell us what um, kind of brought you to this and made it a passion for you Jonathan, I think you're on mute. Thank you. So my, my first uh, psychedelic experience was actually through meditation. Uh, the start of my meditation practice uh, about 22 years ago. Um, and I found out that I could not share so much my ex meditation experience with other people until I met people that uh, have uh, used psychedelics. And then, and then I, I found a community within those people that use psychedelics. And then I said, okay, if their experience is similar to mine, 
there's you know there's some something for me to learn there and uh, about four years ago i was uh, uh, introduced to ayahuasca it gave me a lot of confidence that psychedelics are not dangerous are not addictive and actually beneficial uh, and they helped me a lot with my meditation practice as well so that was my door to it then i explored uh, other substances uh, lsd psilocybin uh, and, and learn how each uh, substance activates my mind in a different way, allows me to go into different spaces, create different emotions, and, and also brings, brings up different healings that I, that I had over the last four or five years. So I'm pretty new to this, uh, but uh, very excited about it. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful point to uh, bring up meditation and the power that that could have uh, um, I think that um, our society really kind of wants to uh, go straight into the psychedelic experience and we don't have time to meditate. And uh, so I, I believe that psychedelics can actually uh, teach you that there is a, a different way of thinking, yet meditation is something that is is very lasting, can be done every single day and induce interesting states much like holotropic breath work uh there's a lot of states that our human body could go into that uh we just don't really know about because we don't dedicate the time to doing that but um mike how about you can you tell us about uh what got you into psychedelics and what made it uh poignant enough to continue work in this space sure so Oddly enough, um, I had been, so I have a penchant to question authority, I think sort of built into me. And I, there's a, there's a lot of valuable work that our institutions provide, but I don't trust they have hundred percent accuracy. So there's this part of me that always sort of demands more evidence. If I, if I feel like something's being told to me that isn't quite true. And so going through school and watching, you know, sitting through dare classes and things like this, it was clear to me that there were some things that were definitely terrible and that I wouldn't want to put anywhere near my body, but there are other things that, that seemed less clear. And it seemed like there, everything was getting thrown into a singular basket and um, there wasn't a lot of clarity or granularity being um, sort of brought to the conversation. And I was, probably originally exposed to psychedelics framed positively from high existence back when I was a reader before I was involved and opportunity to, to take a group of friends who I had known for uh, 10 years. Um, and that environment, I, I found myself uh, sort of arriving at great peace and clarity unlike I had ever experienced before. And after the experience, I had no desire to do it again. I didn't feel the, the itch or a craving. And so I had this real visceral sense that well, this wasn't addictive. I don't feel damaged in any way. In fact, I feel my life has been made uh, more enriched by this experience that I've had. And I, and I struggled to understand why this was something that um, I had been told to fear. And that it's fair that there are, if someone is unprepared or they're in a bad environment, it can be, it, it can damage people. This isn't, uh, you know, psychedelics aren't a, aren't a cure-all. And I think it's important for all of us in this space to be honest about that and not um, sort of, yeah, pr proclaim that this is, this, this will solve all of your, all of your problems. And I don't expect that anyone here is taking that stance. There are those out there who kind of go a little, go a little too crazy and banging the psychedelic drum. But I knew that there was more to there was more to this conversation, more to this story, that this just wasn't, just wasn't something that I needed to, to stay away from because it got me in touch with the sacred in a way or something that felt deeper than um, than what I had been exposed to in my life. Just going about the motions, surfing through the institutions, my education experience, I wasn't acquainted with this something deeper. And having touched it, I knew that this was uh, a space and a, and a place for continued exploration and to do my best to instigate honest conversations around what's actually going on here. 
Very interesting. I, I like that the platform that you are now the director of is what brought you to it. That's uh that's a really cool thing. I also, well, uh, as a D.A.R.E. graduate, but I also won a gold medal for the essay I wrote uh, in D.A.R.E. back in the day. So product of D.A.R.E. <laughs> Allie, how about you? Can you tell us uh, what brought you to psychedelics and uh, decided to dedicate so much time and resources to it? Sure. I, I guess I wasn't paying enough attention in the D.A.R.E. classes because I, <laughs> I had my first LSD experience when I was 15 and it was really frightening. It was huge. It was transpersonal. I left my body. I had no real context for the experience I had. Um, you know, this is back in the 90s when the Internet information was very limited to even understand what the experience would be or how to prepare for that. Um, so from that experience, I really got interested and fascinated with the idea that you could take such a small amount of a substance and that it could shift your whole mind frame, your whole way of seeing the world and feeling this unity and this truth that I felt like I had always known, but I was just remembering again, this connectedness to something larger than myself. So I, I studied, um, I was studying psychology and neuropharmacology and reading about um, near death experiences and, uh, and a lot of uh, philosophy because there wasn't, wasn't books in the library about psychedelics, not in Louisiana where I lived. Uh, so I just really had this deep interest in thinking about like, if you could take a substance and shift your mind in that way, then surely the endogenous neurotransmitters in your brain, can we activate those in similar ways by other techniques? And, you know, meditation, breathing exercises, regular exercise, I think are other means of accessing these places that psychedelics very rapidly it can take you to. So I've just had a, a long, long interest in not only what the experience is about, but yeah, how can we use these experiences to help people with that may have certain mental health conditions? And also how can we be sure people understand the risk and how to prepare and be safe? And that means, you know, knowing what type of substances you're taking, how much the setting, do you have somebody present or that you can call that could help out if it does get frightening and crazy? as psychedelic experiences can. So I just have really come to this work from a deep personal interest in exploring more of what we can learn about our consciousness as well as helping people understand that these are powerful tools and you know, you're know you not gonna take a chainsaw out of your garage without your proper protective equipment. So we need to think at the same level with psychedelics and when we do take them out of the bag, what, what are the proper precautions to make sure that it's safe and that there's benefit and not harm that comes from, from using psychedelics? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, we have a two-part question here that I want to ask you guys. Uh, why do you think psilocybin on a high dose, the heroic dose, gives most people the overwhelming uh, uh, feeling of connection to everything, love, and gratefulness? and A larger question is, do you think psilocybin can save humanity? Mike, what do you think? Do you think uh, psilocybin could save humanity? And uh, why do you think it uh, has that connection aspect to it on a high dose? This is an interesting question. Um, Do I think psilocybin can save humanity? Not solely. I don't think it's just a matter of... uh, dosing everybody on earth and and that and then the solution will reveal itself um i i think it can absolutely help and move us in the right direction because of the the cognitive and emotional shifts that would occur as a result of having some of these profound and transcendent experiences and and most importantly i think those shifts are related to um sort of as ali was was speaking feeling connected to something larger than oneself and being able to take that experience uh, back out into the world where we're acting from a place, not, not only for making our, 
our lives better, but making sort of capital L life better and working to build a world that we may never see. Um, and feeling that connectedness, I think, can help promote that kind of behavior. Um, not even from a place of, of uh, altruism, but actually feeling connected to it and, and really benefiting from it, like finding such great significance and meaning through approaching life that way. Um, as for why it creates that experience, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a deep question. Um, and I'll, I'll just sort of give my like armchair philosophy response because I, I, you know, I really don't know, but I think it might be connected to a, a disruption in the, um, the, the mo the, like a self-referencing mode where we have these sort of conceptions of ourself, these, these images and this sort of concrete sense of who we are. And that starts to, to dissolve or at least become uh, blurrier around the edges making way for more of the rest of capital L life to get through where we feel ourselves having all along been deeply embedded in this world, sculpted by it and, and us sculpting it in return. Uh, and, that, and that's actually the truth. It's just a, a chronic and persistent sensation that we are separate, but in actuality, we've always been, like there is no us independent of the world that we're embedded in. Uh, we are fundamentally inextricably connected and, and it, it seems to dilate the, the imagination or uh, the psyche such that that can be experienced in a felt way. Um, so that's my shot at that, that question. Yeah, it's great. It's beautiful. I, I will um, add one of the comments that we uh, have received from Dr. Danny Weiss, who's on our board. Thank you for being here, Danny. Uh, that, you know, high doses aren't always the way to go, too, by the way. We don't always have to do the heroic dose. Um, obviously, there's the concept of microdosing, which is um, becoming uh, very mainstream. Uh, and also the idea of not having to, you know, go to the stars every single time. So let's definitely consider that and also not shame anyone who, uh, isn't doing the heroic dose. If if it's um, new, it can be very, very scary and um, just definitely something to absolutely consider that you don't always have to go big, you know. So, uh, Jonathan, real quickly, how what do you think? Do you think, uh, mm -hmm. you think psilocybin or psychedelics as a whole can save humanity? I, I think humanity can save humanity. <laughs> And that uh, I, just as I see as uh, in, in meditation, a, a great way to connect with, with the universe, uh, psychedelics are a, another way to do so. Uh, I, 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 on a neuro neurological level, uh, when we take psilocybin, there is a change in how our brain function for a certain period of time. And the default mode network that produces a certain sense of ego and identity uh, receives less energy. Uh, and and now our brain works different. It also happens when we when we meditate, and that relates to the sensation of connecting with something that is bigger than us. Uh, so that's just a physio physio uh, neurological reaction to uh, to the molecule. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely see psychedelics and entheogens uh, playing a big role in in the future. Of, of humanity and helping humanity solve its own issues on an individual level, if it's depression, PTSD, traumas of all sorts, and also on a social level. It has the capacity to do so, and it has, in fact, been used in the past over uh, years, hundreds of years in tribal communities to, as a function of, uh, from a medicine perspective, but also from a community perspective. Uh, so, yeah, I think it has a great, great uh, power to, to help us change uh, for the better our society. Yeah, I agree. And I would uh, just mention now that the, what, what this world is uh, lacking and in, in actually needing, it's, it's not psychedelics, it's, it's what we're talking about, it's community. I think that we're uh, searching for belonging and connection and um, to be held by those who love us. And uh, so 
psychedelics are showing us that that is what we're missing, hopefully. Uh, I hope that people aren't relying on this to be, like Mike said, a cure-all, because it's not. But uh, what it can do is make you become more connected, more involved in your community. And Ali, if you'd like to field the question on whether psychedelics are going to save humanity or not, uh, we can, but uh, we're running short on time. And one question that did come up that I know is very important to you is uh, the connection between um, psychedelics and addiction. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, um, where you think psychedelics will address and help with addiction? If you'd like to address the first question, feel free. But again, uh, addiction is a very um, hot topic when it comes to psychedelics, and that's a passion point for you guys. Um, can you touch on what that might look like in the future? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's a very prevalent um, thing that people face. And we know from some of the research coming out that in the context of psychotherapy and motivational type coaching that using psychedelics might help people to shift these patterns and gain different perspectives on their life. And it, the experience itself could be opening a door and allowing someone to maybe step into new ways of being, step into new ways of living their life. And it's not a silver bullet and it's not gonna work for everyone and it's not just gonna make problems disappear. But it does seem that maybe it's the neuroplastic effects that can occur from psychedelics, which has been shown to increase uh, new synapses in the brain. Ayahuasca has been shown to increase the pro pro proliferation of new neurons. And this is outside of the brain, so we don't actually know if this is happening in human brains yet. But this idea of the brain becoming more readily available to learn something new or to shift behaviors is hugely important when we think about conditions such as uh, addictions. So I do think that there is a lot of promise here and more research needed and, and a lot of follow-up and aftercare I think is really the key for people that are struggling with addictions is that it's a process and psychedelics can be a part of that process, but I don't see it as being this is just going to remove this problem that you have. So it's, um, you know, something we're, we're working on in many angles to uh, help when these treatments become available in the U.S. to have places people can go to have this kind of long-term care and this long-term support. And also, what can we do now, which is peer, peer recovery groups is a really accessible way for people to have this long-term engagement, to find new friends, to help people go out in nature to receive this healing and connection from other plants and the natural environment is another way we see that psychedelics are open people's receptivity to to nature and others. So there's still a lot to learn, I, but we're definitely going in the right direction with the research trials and the groups that are coming available. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, we're coming up on our hour, so we know everybody has tons of other webinars to get to, and uh, I'm very excited that you guys had uh, joined us and uh, dedicated your time to everything that you're doing and to this webinar. Uh, we hope that Unlimited Voices will continue to be a platform to have folks like you come and answer some really good questions. Tell us about your organizations. Uh, everybody can uh, go to unlimitedsciences.org to find out more about us. Um, we will have a follow-up email talking about these wonderful organizations. Thank you, Plant Medicine, Project New Day, Psychedelic Support, High Existence. Please give these folks a follow and uh, let your community know about what they are up to. And Jonathan, Ali, Mike, thank you guys so much for attending and uh, being part of this. And again, thank you to Lifecycle uh, Unlimited 15 for sponsoring this uh, webinar. And we hope to uh, put on more of these and this concludes the, the very first one. So thank you for everybody who joined and all the wonderful questions that you asked and uh, we hope to make these better and better and better. And uh, uh, if you again are field called, please uh, donate to Unlimited Sciences and we've got some really cool gifts and you can help change the world along with all of us. So thank you guys very much. And uh, we will 
Um, see you soon. Thank you very much, Dale. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dale. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye everybody. Now. Bye.